Hi, my name is Giovanni Montero Islas. I'm 22, I was born in San Diego, and I'm Mexican. You see, I used to be pretty racially confused, you could say. I grew up about 10 minutes from the border and went to a bilingual elementary school where practically everyone was Mexican. Me being a fair-skinned, blonde, blue-eyed little fella, I had no other explanation other than I'm half white, half Mexican. That answer satisfied everyone, even my parents. Due to the lack of any real coverage over the initial contacts by the Spaniards, it took well over half my life to realize that I look this way because I'm Mexican. You see, most Americans view Mexicans simply as, well, from Mexico. However, Mexico is a land of mixed people. Traditionally, the diffusion of Spanish and indigenous. I am mestizo. Through a DNA test, I discovered that I am 37% indigenous to Mexico, 30% Spanish, 11% Portuguese, and 8% of Basque. My mom is 50% indigenous, and my dad 33. That explained everything. Well, not really. Instead of me just being Mexican, I realized I had an entire culture to uncover. Most of my life, my native roots were seldom emphasized. In fact, in Mexico, the term Indio or Indian can be used as an insult to describe someone as ignorant or brutish. For much of my life, I was ignorant of my genealogical and ethnological history. After months of digesting and studying the colonization of the Americas and falling into a deep sadness because of it, I ended up with more questions than answers. It became extremely confusing to trace my lineage due to the lack of records. I gave up. At this point, I was happy to primarily venerate more well-known cultures over my own. Either way, I was content to remember the native peoples of this land. Mesoamerican anthropology? Heck yeah! Through this class, we learned skills that could help me identify traits of my possible ancestors and their place in their environment. Alright, you all learned the same skills I did in this class, so let's get straight to it. First though, I'm going to conduct an interview. I figured since I'm tracing my ancestors, I would interview the oldest living relative of my indigenous ancestors, my nana, or my grandma. Due to time constraints, I will focus only on one grandparent, as all four of mine come from central Mexico and are firstly indigenous by blood. Mi nombre es María Águila Torres. Nací en un rancho que se llama La Servilleta, municipio de Talpa, Jalisco. Mis abuelos eran de una hacienda muy grande que se llamaba Santa Getrudes, la, la hacienda. Es municipio de Jalisco. La tierra donde yo nací y me crié hasta los 10 años era un rancho con muchas vegetaciones, tenía árboles frutales silvestres, me crié entre muchos animales, vacas, puercos, gallinas y caballos y había milpas, había montañas muy bonitas, muchos árboles muy grandes y luego había ríos con camarones y pescado. También había mucha siembra de frijol y maíz y muchos cafetales. Era un terreno muy grande donde había todas esas cosas. Oh, el clima, muy bonito. Más o menos como aquí en San Diego. Menos calor. Menos calor. Mucho llovía. Mucho. Desde el mes de, de junio hasta octubre. Todos los días. Pero la lluvia era como de una hora y se quitaba y salía el sol y podíamos caminar en los charcos de agua que se hacía. Y puedo decir que me crié como libre, salvaje, en el, entre las plantas, entre las hierbas y frutas. Y fui a la escuela, a una escuela católica, porque en esa área no había escuela del gobierno, solo católica. Y de religión soy católica 100% y aprendí desde niña todo lo que es de la religión católica. ¿Y ahí donde creciste, practicaban o hablaban de la cultura indígena? No. No mucho. Well, she was fully assimilated. Archaeology, please save the day. 
So I decided to start where my DNA was leading me, North Jalisco, West Guanajuato, and Aguas Calientes. From my research online, I found out that this area was ruled by the Chichimeca. The only issue is that the term Chichimeca was a label given by the Aztecs which described the people of the north. It was a broad term that included many different groups of people. Since some of these groups were hunter-gatherers, nomadic, and or semi-nomadic, not much evidence was kept of them. The most I'll be able to learn about my possible ancestors will come from the archaeological sites and accounts from the Aztecs and Spaniards. Let's dig in. In a 1994 paper published by the Academy of American Franciscan History titled Discovering the Chichimeca, we can find these quotes. The term was used by Nahuatl speakers inhabitant of the Central Valley of Mexico to designate the people who lived north and west of the Valley of Mexico and has variously translated to mean son of dogs, rope suckers, or eagles. For the Spanish, the Chichimeca were wild, nomadic people who lived north of the Valley of Mexico. They had no fixed dwelling places, lived by hunting, wore no clothes, and furiously resisted foreign intrusion into their territory. The author mentions that often, conceptualization of the enemy serves as a political weapon and unsurprisingly, the barbarian enemies of the Spanish lived in an area of plentiful silver which was later exploited. The Aztecs, however, viewed them with less animosity, as Chichimec descent provided one source of political legitimacy amongst many. In a report called, Report on the Chichimeca and the Justness on the War Against Them, written before 1585 by Gonzalo de las Casas, he explains the etymology of Chichimeca. Chichi, or dog, and mecat, meaning rope in Nahuatl. He noted that the Chichimeca lived off hunting like dogs and used string bows. Of the many Chichimeca groups, Casas identifies four, Pamis, Guamares, Guachichiles, and Zacatecos. Also existed the Tecueches, Cascanes, and Otomu, among many others. Some lost the time. In his report, La Casas mentioned that they ate wild fruit and roots, but did not cultivate vegetables or trees. They also hunted rabbits, deers, birds, and fish. In the typical Zacateco unit, the women focused on domestic duties and carried much of the supply, whereas the men were primarily hunters and warriors. These accounts also describe a lack of religion in the northern region. Since religious practices were common amongst the civilized population of the Valley of Mexico, the lack thereof was considered brutish to the Spaniards. However, the author notes, La Casas also used this standard and likewise did not discern any form of religion practiced by the Chichimecas other than exclamations to the sky while looking at certain stars. He rejected the idea expressed by some that ritual torture of prisoners was a type of religious sacrifice and dismissed it as a form of cruelty that the devil has shown them. The former seems a more logical explanation and several Chichimeca groups have proven to be spiritually active. Lastly, of the things found to be barbaric of the Chichimeca was the lack of clothing. Initial accounts record nothing more than covering of genitalia with cloth, animal skin, or grass. Their bodies were usually covered, however, with paint, typically from minerals, which was a widespread practice throughout the Gran Chichimeca. Although this may be an overview of a great portion of the area's geography, there are certainly differences amongst the many Chichimeca nations. And which one was mine? In noting the complex and chronologically expansive migration of the region, I decided for the purposes of this project to identify a few nations that correlated strongly with my genealogical origins. If we look at these overlaid maps, we can see factions of the Chichimeca of which the Cascanes and Zacateco seem to be likely candidates. In 2020, the Mexican Institute of National Archaeology and History, backed by the Mexican government's Secretary of Culture, hosted an extensive interview of archaeologist Laura Solar Valverde regarding her recent work at sites residing in these territories, particularly in the south of Zacatecas. As a part of the series, Somos Nuestra Memoria, or We Are Our Memory, Laura focuses on Cerro de las Ventanas and Cerro del Teúl, and briefly mentions La Quemada. She mentions that these two sites lay among a succession of mountains, valleys, and rivers. She notes that around two centuries before our current era, agriculture, especially maize, began to appear. This also insinuated permanent or semi-permanent settlements. The area's southern region had superior conditions which allowed Cerro del Teúl to outlast other major centers such as La Quemada. Although many of these sites interacted with each other, Laura explains that around the 9th century there was a strong connection to the Pacific coast that included material culture such as textiles, among other things. The involvement in these routes was another factor that allowed Teúl to survive its counterparts. Although large structures were scarce in the Gran Chichimeca, they nonetheless were cultural centers and place for interaction. She mentions that these sites share a similar worldview, including rituals ensuring that gods maintain world balance and architecture linked to the agricultural cycle. 
Laura Valverde also presents evidence of shaft tombs which are primarily associated with the culture of ancient West Mexico. The tombs demonstrated a strong connection with nature and largely resembled one's return to the earth. The architecture, particularly at the Teul Plaza, resembled the story of creation. It featured canals to fill the plaza with water, a serpent around the perimeter, the base as a mountain, and the resemblance of the sun at the center. These features depict a watery scene involving Quetzalcoatl and a mountain helping the sun rise, and thus creating life. The archaeologist notes virtually no connection between the mestizo descendants and their pre-Hispanic ancestors, and I would have to agree. She mentions a near genocide led by the Spanish and aided by the Aztecs that forced the population into the mountains. This may explain my family's migration to the west coast, although it's certainly impossible to know when my lineage began migrating from this area. It is interesting to note, however, that my nana grew up only about 180 miles from Cerro del Teul, at the center of my origins, about 422 years after contact. In a paper describing human bone deposits from La Quemada, dated in the Epic Classic, the three authors analyzed the discovery of bone piles found above ground at the site. Nelson, Darling, and Kais present osteological evidence that, amongst other things, the temple served as a charnel house in which the bones of revered ancestors or community members were preserved. The author reaches this conclusion due to the lack of abrasion marks that might appear on an enemy's corpse or after cannibalistic activity. No dismemberment or defleshing is apparent through trauma evidence, suggesting that the soft flesh was allowed to decay naturally before the disarticulated bones were set on or suspended above the temple floor. As noted previously, to pinpoint my ancestors is difficult, not only due to the lack of written record, but also due to the continuous migration in the area. The thesis, Prehistoric Culture Diffusion in the Gran Chichimeca, explains just that. The author Eugene C. Lee argues that Toltec and other Mesoamerican cultures had influences that spread as far as the American Southwest. He writes of cultural diffusions such as shared deity motifs and pantheon similarities. The author argues the similarity of what have been called ball courts in the American Southwest. In Mesoamerica, this feature traditionally resembles the conflict between Quetzalcoatl and Tezcatlipoca, light and darkness. He points out that the adobe composition rather than stone may account for the structural differences from traditional Mesoamerican ball courts. He also provides connections between the two regions God of Rain, which understandably would be important throughout both areas. He also mentions T-shaped entrances whose origins are still hotly debated as they span across the Americas. Regardless, the flow of culture and ideas is apparent. Clay figurines and art patterns are compared, one of which is a figurine found on a ruin in New Mexico that the National Park Services presents, was made in the Valley of Mexico between 700 and 900 Common Era, and is most likely Toltec and of Teotihuacan style. Evidence of feathers, remains, and carvings of parrots and macaws also emphasize this grand diffusion of culture. It is apparent from Chihuahua to Arizona and New Mexico that there was utilization of species of birds which are native to the south of Mexico and below. These animals and their bright feathers also served as spiritual items in those regions. Lastly, Lee points out the shared cosmology and astrology which undoubtedly became an essential tool for survival, community building, and a widely accepted way of viewing the world before colonization. From my research, it is apparent that the story of the Chichimeca, including the story of my ancestors, is one full of complications, uncertainty, and nonetheless tragedy. Although I may never know for certain to which tribe I belong, hopefully future interest and research on the matter will allow archaeologists to paint a clearer picture of these uncolonized people. There are many lost records, but there is also much archaeological work to be done. One thing is clear, and that is that people and culture in this area were continuously flowing. It is likely that some of the traits of my actual ancestors are shared amongst the many indigenous people throughout this continent. Although modern colonial borders may slow this diffusion, in pre-colonial times there were no limits. For now, I don't think I'm extremely far off from the truth. From accounts by my nana, I don't think that her migrating, gathering, and rural lifestyle was too far removed from our past. Regardless of whether I knew it growing up, I've been able to participate in indigenous traditions all my life. With the new information I gather, I can revive some of this land's lost culture because what is more Mesoamerican, more Native American than ancestor veneration? As a quote from a member of our very own Kumeyaay, the first people of San Diego, just as the sun rises to begin its journey for the day, we too begin the journey of our lives as children. There are storms and mountains in the path. They change our rays of light and our colors. 
I come from this dirt and this land, and I will return to it one final time. Until that day comes, I will shine as the brightest flames of the sun. Those around me will know my connection to this place, and all that is life, everything that flows in this land, has flowed through my blood, my eyes, my breath, and my heart.